Uh, my name is Mayur, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Dream Collective. And uh, this might be the last session that we have as a part of the launch, but definitely is one of the most talked about topics. Uh, seems like a basic problem, but is not that basic. And uh, we have put the topic as plastic bag, the carrot on the stick, which is more on what the approach should be followed. Um, I'm very excited to have a panel which will be coming from different angles on which on how we should look at this problem and looking uh, forward to a lot of questions from you guys uh, because at the end of the day the change has to come from our audience over here while we try to enable it so really looking forward to the session i'll quickly take two minutes just to introduce the green collective and the work that we do so um, the green collective singapore is basically a collective of around 40 plus brands sustainable brands were curated based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we started the collective out of sheer frustration of a small social enterprise not being able to scale up because there was really no ecosystem in Singapore three, four years back. Things have changed a lot. So if you were a retail focused social enterprise uh, pursuing sustainability as an impact criteria, there's, it was very tough to scale up. It was very tough to sustain and um, that is what we wanted to solve. And we wanted to solve it through a cooperative model wherein different brands come in, they share the workload of running a whole business operation while of course sharing data, intelligence and getting economies of scale while still staying sustainable and small. So that's what, um, that's what we try to do. Uh, we started it with uh, uh, retail. So we actually have a, a retail uh, store in Funa. And uh, what we're doing is uh, this weekend, we are actually launching our online presence as well, wherein we have a website where you can read up, have a lot of experiences that we provide. Uh, and basically in a way, kickstart your own journey towards sustainability because everyone's different. Everyone's choices are different and everyone's sentiment and understanding of sustainability. So we respect that. And what we want to do is provide you an alternate to what you are currently consuming. So this is what the website looks like. What we call ourselves is the fact that we're creating a responsible kampung in the little red dot. Uh, our brand members are basically our green khakis because they are very, very intensely involved in running the green collective. So if you have to go right now to Funan, you will find two brand owners behind the cashier desk. You can talk to them, they can educate you, and they can answer your questions much better than a lot of other cashiers normally could. So uh, it's a very tight-knit community and a very involved community, and we want you to take it digital so that we can reach out to many more of you. And yes, this weekend we are running an offer so that you have 20% off of any purchases using the code TGC20. As I say this, let me make it very, very clear. Please don't buy things that you don't need. Yes, we are in the business of retail commerce, but before that, we are in the business of responsible retail. It's not supposed to promote new buying or unnecessary buying. It's supposed to promote you choosing alternatives and making different aspects of your life sustainable. Because guess what? We're running out of time on that. And even though we are in Singapore with a small city state, our impact really, really matters. So this is what we've been doing actually over the last three days. We've had uh, discussions on greenwashing and sustainable consumption. We've talked about food waste. We've talked about fashion today morning. And, uh, and yes, now we're talking about plastic waste. Um, today evening, 2 to 6 p.m., we have our green khakis coming and explaining their sustainable journey. So join us on IG Live for that as well. Um, and that is basically the whole program that we wanted to do. But in general, we do the Kampung Chats quite regularly, which is basically to increase awareness on different sustainability-related issues and to introduce you to social enterprises that exist in Singapore who are tackling these problems. So that was a brief introduction from me. What I'll do is I'll pass it on to our moderator for the session, June, uh, who's a good friend and has been We've been talking about sustainability for some time now with each other. So I'm really, really happy that she's moderating this session, uh, which is based on the question that she asked me for the first time when we met, which was talking about plastic and sustainability and overall. Uh, so June, 
completely over to you to take the session forward. All right, thank you, Mayu. Um, thank you for inviting me to be the moderator for this session. So, hello, everybody. My name is June. Um, as you know, I'm a trained journalist and I have been covering environmental issues for a number of years. Well, and it's also through my reporting that I got to know about the wonderful people behind the Green Collective. And I'm really supportive of what they as a community is trying to achieve for sustainability in Singapore. And that's why I'm here today this afternoon to really just lend my support. So joining me here today are panels, the wonderfully passionate Hailene, Executive Director of Zero Waste Singapore, Roxanne, who is co-founder of Bearpack, and Deliang, who is Associate Director of for analytics and behavior change at NUS. Now, first off, can we have our panelists say hello and give a brief introduction of yourself and what you do? Uh, Hailene, do you want to start? Yes, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thank you to the Green Collective for having me here today. So my name is Hailene. I'm from Zero Waste Singapore, and we are a charity non-governmental organization uh, that drives uh, zero waste action in Singapore through education and advocacy and we focus on four key areas of waste namely plastic disposables, food waste, uh, household recycling as well as organizational waste. Yes. Roxanne? Hi everybody, thank you very much for hosting this Green Collective. It's a pleasure to be here among the wonderful panelists. Um, my name is Roxanne and I'm co-founder of a company called Bearpack. We provide reusable containers for food and beverage to be shared among citizens um, in order to encourage the reuse model, which is part of a circular economy towards sustainability uh, here in Singapore, but also worldwide, it's a model that's being adopted and that we hope we can share this vision with people and show them that there really is an alternative to single use. Um, and lastly, we have the thorn among the roses. De Liang, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello everyone, I'm De Liang. Thank you, um, the organizers, for inviting me to join the session today. I'm actually from NUS, from the Office of Estate Development. Although I don't have a background in building buildings, infrastructure, but I'm actually uh, training in uh, behavioral science, economics, and environmental management. So in NUS, I work on um, sustainability and behavior-related issues. Okay? So I'm quite new to NUS, about a year. So previously, I worked in NEA for about nine years, having um, led the behavioral science and data science division, uh, the sections in the research and statistics department, and uh, in the, um, spent a number of years in community engagement uh, when I started out in NEA. Look forward to the discussion. Yep. Great. Now, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Now, obviously, today our topic is about plastic bags, the carrot or the stick. Now, obviously, plastic bags have become quite a contentious topic in recent years. Um, um, but I think what we need to know is that uh, when we talk about plastic bags, we seem to have this sinister idea that it is evil, it pollutes the environment, and it kills marine life. Now, that is all true, but the fact is, and I think everyone on the panel here can agree, that the main issue that we have today is that plastic is not evil as a material, but the problem is in the way that we are consuming it, and that is excessively. So it's the way that our linear economic model has produced this sort of system where goods are produced, it is consumed, and it's disposed of. And this model assumes that there is just endless economic growth and that it really doesn't consider the planet's exhaustible resources. So on that note, um, I'd like the panel to pick a team. Are you team carrot or team stick? And why? You are uh, Hailene, do you want to start off? Um, yes, sure. Okay, so team care or team steak um, sounds a little bit cliche, but I'm for both, but with an inclination toward the stick because I still believe that preventive measures might seem more effective at reduction, but to prevent backlash, it is definitely good to be positive and um, you know, educate people at the same time. And I think Roxanne has different ideas about this. Let's hear from you. Yes, uh, I, although I do think that it's good to have um, incentives uh, that encourage a good behavior, I am more for the stick. Um, and this is based on uh, previous studies um, on countries around the world that have shown that um, although the incentive might be of the same value, so you might get a five cents, for example, tax on a plastic bag, and you might get a five, uh, five cents um, bonus on bringing your own. Uh, the bonus does not work 
uh, as much as the tax does. The perceived impact is very different, even though the value is the same. So I'm definitely stick first. And the bonus is, well, it's a bonus. If it's there, it's there, but it's not what's going to change people's habits, in my opinion. Deleang, do you agree? I'm actually for either. The, it depends on how you actually implement the initiative in the particular context that, that, that you want to do this, right? So, for example, um, if you want to do a ban, if you can do a ban, for example, in a convenience store, where the behavior takeaway is quite simple, maybe you buy just a can of drink or a or, or bottle, so it, um, you, know, you don't really need um, plastic bags per se, right? So it's pretty fine. But if you try to do this, for example, in a supermarket, all right, or nationwide, what you will see is that I guess there'll be un unintended behavioral consequences. For in today's economy, people can buy things online and you'll find that something like plastic bags have no shelf life. Basically, they can be stored in your storeroom forever and then you'll realize that people will be like maybe uh, mass stockpiling plastic bags, for instance, through the ban. So, I'm, so it's a question of context and where you implement uh, the initiative. For plastic bag tax, it depends on how you design it too. Okay. Um, for example, um, rather than just giving people like, I, in two weeks ago, I was in NTUC at uh, Finest. I realized that they charge the tax as part of the receipt, right? So it make it really convenient for people, right? People, sometimes you don't even see the, the tax itself. If you like, for example, you purchase a hundred dollar worth of groceries, 20 cents is really like, you know, uh, maybe it doesn't really hit the belt, right? So as a behavioral scientist, if I were to implement a plastic bag tax in a supermarket, I would actually make them fish the, take out the, the coin and actually deposit it rather than just like, the, you know, do the pay wave thing, you know. So it's trying to make it more inconvenient for them and highlight the saliency of the thing, right. But at the end of the day, right, um, I think where we are looking at is really trying to get people to uh, be less wasteful, right. The tax is just a reminder of that it's not really meant to penalize people, right. Another solution, for instance, I, I would suggest is that if you do want to uh, keep the receipts of those those tax right you can actually give them tokens and they can donate to the specific charity um, that 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 they for instance they, they they prefer and that could actually bridge the the gap between um, you doing something and actually feeling uh, for the for the cost right so there's a social and environment thing you can also um, um, put in so to me it's a question of how you implement those things and in what context you do so so I'm actually team context instead of team characteristics. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a very interesting way of thinking about it, Dylan. And you actually jumped my questions. I was about to ask for alternative solutions, but let's take it back to the, the question of um, measures. So I want to talk about state measures. Now, we have seen that in recent years, um, the government is trying to change the narrative. For example, it started to implement, you know, um, they are prohibiting disposable utensils for eating in at new hawker centers only. And they are mandating that companies report um, their plans on packaging. I think that has been postponed to next year because of COVID. So I want to talk about these uh, Singapore specific measures. Um, what do you think about it? And do you think it would work in a Singapore context? Hmm. Anyone want to take the question, Chris? Hi, I mean, you work with Ground and Partners, so maybe you have any suggestions um, on these measures? Are they enough? Um, I would definitely say that's not enough. Um, although there are upcoming selected EPR measures, so EPR are extended producer responsibility measures uh, that the government is going to implement in the upcoming years, like the deposit refund um, uh, scheme or the deposit refund system, it will be good um, if uh, because those addresses like maybe specific packaging ways and it will be good because it uh, if there's a certain amount of built-in deposit fee that one person pays when one buys a bottle of drink and you know when they can only have the deposit back when they recycle or when they return a bottle to a machine so um that is good in in, in a way and I, actually i'm quite excited to see how it how it will turn out or you know the actual amount of uh, the deposit fee that will be tapped um, as a premium to the bottled drinks. So that's exciting. Um, what other alternatives? Definitely uh, for Zero Waste SG, we are pushing for and really, really advocating for the plastic bag charge. 
because we really, really believe in transferring the cost of the plastic back to the consumer. So cost does not mean, um, uh, does not necessarily mean monetary cost, but it also includes environmental costs and resource costs. So we don't take that item for granted. And hopefully um, when, you know, there is a cost tag to something that we assume or we are used to thinking that it should be free, we will not see a lot of plastic bags, you know, flying around or lifted around the walkways because, you know, those are essentially money. So it becomes tangible for the consumer and it, and it becomes uh, something that they can see and hopefully they will not take for granted as much. Yeah, I would tag on to that and say that um, one of the main issues that we have today is that we price our products wrong. Um, globally, we price products based on just their manufacturing costs. Uh, this is an issue with all types of products, not just plastic bags. We forget that we should, uh, especially in the context of developing sustainable uh, living, um, price in the conditions to getting rid of this product. If it is going to become a waste or if it has taken from the environment in a specific way, we should be factoring this into the cost of the product. And this tags onto what Haylin is saying that nothing is really free. It's not because plastic bags are derived from petroleum and that petroleum is used towards other uses, which makes the, pla the plastic bags free in a way. Um, it's a low grade petroleum. If we look at petroleum, there are different types of grades of petroleum and they're used for different things. Um, high grade petroleums are gonna be what are gonna fuel your planes, for example, and then low cost, uh, low grade petroleums are gonna be doing things like plastic bags. But this does not mean that it's free to the environment. There's a lot of resources to go into extracting and people just forget this. And because we've for so long priced plastic bags so cheap and they've come as like the freebie with all of our purchases, um, we, we lose touch with where do these products come from, what are the consequences to the environment to extract them, but also what are the consequences to try and manage the waste. And if we actually factored the cost, what it is to collect them, recycle them, dispose of them, or even convert them to transform them into new plastics, the price would be much higher. And I think this is an interesting starting point on like how do we reattribute the actual value to the plastic and if we can communicate this to people people know that what they buy has a cost and, and why they pay a certain price if we can re-educate people on why plastic is priced this way instead of presenting it as it's a tax we're making money off imposing a tax the perception of tax is really negative and so the idea of the stick for me is not necessarily just the wording tax people are averse to taxes and they'll be very um, you know, quite angry with, with these sort of measures put into place. But instead, if you reprice it, not because it's a tax, but because it's the actual cost of the product, I think you can have a more interesting conversation with re-educating people and, and getting a new kind of respect for what plastic really is. That's really interesting. And that's also bringing in the element of the carrot, that is the education or the awareness into a so-called stick measure. I just wanted to talk about the fact that you talk about pricing our products. Because for a long time now in the supermarkets, we are always talking about paying that extra 10 cent, 20 cent for the bag if you were to use it. And um, this is from my own sentiments on the ground when I go out to interview people for some of my reports. People are they, they do not think it's a big deal to pay 10 cents, 20 cents. Um, they, would, they would not change the habits. They would continue to you know, pay that money because 10 cents, 20 cents in Singapore context at least does not seem to amount to much. So how then do we price it correctly so that the consumer understands and not see it as a punishment, but rather a way to think about you know, plastic bag use and at the same time, not pushing them away to other forms of consumerism, like De Liang mentioned, you know, going online to purchase because then they won't be charged at all. So anyone want to take these questions? Maybe De Liang first? I'll just take a quick one. Um, you're right. Once you frame it as a tax, it becomes sensitive. So it's a framing of the word, right? So uh, some years ago when I was a student, <laughs> we implemented the so-called plastic bag tax in the US. We didn't call it a tax. We call it a rebate to earth right? We bid to earth, we bid to charity and let people know what the proceeds uh, were meant for, right? So that's a quick one um, from a psychological perspective. How do you frame those issues, right? So instead of loss framing, you, 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 you frame it to be more gain frame because we are, human beings are more attuned to feeling losses. So the same amount of loss they feel will be uh, psychologically substantially higher compared to the gains. Yeah. So that's, that's one quick way to, to uh, my response to this. Yeah. Um, and then maybe also, uh, 
it would be interesting to remember that we're not trying to, like you said, not trying to move people towards avoiding the problem by reverting to another solution. And that's where the focus on the plastic bag is maybe not the best approach. We talk a lot about the disposable single use plastic bag and yes, it's because it's prevalent and it's the number one type of bag that we use to, you know, go to the supermarket and get our groceries. But it's actually educating around the whole disposability that we should be uh, addressing. So, um, for example, in Chicago, I know it's not the context of Singapore, but bear with me because of psychology is the same. Um, when they implemented a ban in 2015, um, they noticed that supermarkets who were still wanting to provide a convenience service to their customers, they contoured the ban, uh, went around it by providing a different type of bag instead. So whether it was a paper bag or a heavier type of plastic bag, because this, was, this escaped the single use plastic bag rule, because that was only applicable to those really thin ones. And this was a huge problem because Yes, it's slightly decreased the use of bags um, because the supermarkets were a bit less keen to just freely give them out because it costed them more. But at the same time, that actual bag had like a, a three, four, or even up to 10 time higher carbon footprint. Um, and it was still being given free, but the perception was, oh, it's a reusable bag, um, so it's friendlier. People were still disposing their waste in it, so that's not friendlier. And then the same thing with the paper bag. People are like, oh, it's a natural material, it's biodegradable, so it's naturally more, more friendly. So the focus on the single-use plastic bag as being the root of all evil and the one that we should be taxing and the one that we should be fighting against is a bit wrong. And so you have to remind people about this so that they, if they are themselves inclined to try and avoid it, that they actually feel empowered to know that it's not because they're just going around the problem and using another type of disposable that they're um, making any positive impact. Um, and so applying a rule to the disposable bag should not be just the disposable bags. It should be to all types of disposables and it should also be applied to the online shopping. And what is, uh, so what is, yeah, what is online, not just offline, because otherwise you're just, yeah, you're just redirecting people to doing their shopping online and to feeling like it's none of their issue and none of their concern because the plastic bag arrives to them whether they make the decision or not. Yeah, definitely agree with uh, what the Liang and Robzen has mentioned with regards to the context and also if something is being implemented, um, a punitive measure is being implemented, um, it cannot just we, we cannot just consider like the material in itself, but the way the item is being used, like um, what June yourself has also mentioned. Um, on the other hand, right, um, the interesting thing that I wanted to share was, um, because we did the Bring Your Own Back campaign with the supermarkets last year, um, um, and, um, you know, uh, quite a number of uh, fair price outlets have started the plastic bag charge trial. Um, and over time, so actually I did check in with them to, you know, to ask, so um, how has the charge been going? Is it effective? Um, I have not checked in since um, because I think it's been a couple of months, but in the beginning, I think, and months after, um, they were saying that there has been almost immediately, um, almost a 50% drop in the demand of the uh, take-up rate of the plastic bags themselves. Uh, hopefully, it has not uh, tapered down much, uh, but the idea is that I mean, I think on the ground, people are still very sensitive about uh, uh, plastic bags and, you know, having to be charged for it, um, especially the heartlanders. So I would say it depends on the dynamics and the group of uh, people uh, who sort of like, in, in terms of how they react to the plastic bag charge. Although definitely for, for fair price, they are doing cost per transaction. So like what the Liang said, right? It doesn't matter how much you buy or how many plastic bags you use, you just pay 20 cents one off for like how many ever plastic bags you might take. So definitely uh, we support like a higher cost uh, in that sense of either per bag or you maybe get the two, first two bags free and then the rest you have to pay by per bag, something like that. Yeah. Can I just chime in, you know, just that on yeah, that uh, my experience, um, my personal experience, when we first implemented the plastic bag uh, uh, rebate to Earth project, not plastic bag tax, rebate to Earth project and uh, we started in the bookstores, right? Where you just buy a book and, and whatnot. So it's quite easy. So we managed to persuade um, the co-op, NUS co-op bookstore to adopt. And today they are still practicing this, right? And then we tried out in the fruits and drink stores, right? So immediately we saw like what you say, 80% reduction and that sort of thing in uh, plastic bag use. But over 10 years, uh, more than 10 years actually, now it's in the, probably the 12th year, 
right? We, we extend it to uh, other FMB outlets. We realize that um, the behavior has plateaued, right? It has become like um, just another thing that you do, right? In, in on the campus. So the kind of value that we are encouraging uh, of not wasting does not translate yet into other behaviors like usables and whatnot. Okay, there's still takeaways and all these things. So you gotta be mindful that when we use incentives or disincentives, right, that it can be very transactional. You prime people uh, into that transactional mode, it becomes 10 cents, 20 cents, right? But actually you're talking about that, that value, right? So that must be coupled by the relevant campaigns like what Hylin said, the relevant education, right? To keep promoting. It's just not about those things. It's about a reminder of what, what you do. And in the larger context, back to my favorite thing, team context, right? In the context, for example, in FMBs, when you design a new canteen or design an FMB outlet, from the start, right? You can introduce so-called uh, all those tenancy requirements for take back, right? Or introduce that uh, your the new hawker centers or whatnot, you know, that uh, uh, reusables is the default, right? So when you start a new new environment, people are getting used to the environment, uh, getting used to the new place, right? They are trying to figure out what's what's uh, the, the the behavior that's required, and they are more receptive to those changes, right? I don't think people are, are adverse against environmental issues, um, environmental solutions. It's just that how we introduce them. So uh, my preference actually is to introduce um, the, the the incentives and uh, disincentives with the with the education uh, required, and in the in particular for new areas. Yeah. Yeah, and, and maybe if I can also tag on, <laughs> um, I think. Um, that along those lines, uh, we prime convenience. And in Singapore, we always talk about convenience being king. Um, I mean, I think worldwide this is true, but especially in Singapore, because uh, it's, it's um, the way that HDBs have been designed, the way we have supermarket at the bottom of the, of the housing estates, I think we're even more primed to this. Uh, whereas if I, I don't know if I go back home, a lot of people still live in the countryside where you actually have to go out of your way to you know, get your food, go out of your way to dispose of your waste, go out of your way all the time. You don't have that so much here. But when designing these new spaces that Dylan mentions, um, maybe a notion we should be bringing back in is how can we make disposables inconvenient? How could we condition our environment so that if you have disposables, there are ways that you have to dispose of them that become inconvenient enough that the reusable system um, and reuse and preservation of materials is actually more convenient to you as a consumer and you'll find easier to do and achieve than the way we've designed it now. Now we've designed it really in a way that disposables are convenient because we throw them down the chute. Whereas the reusables, we have to go and we have to clean them. We have to remember to use them. We don't have a system in place that makes the reusable easy. But if we did, then we would be changing the discussion and we wouldn't be having this, oh, it's convenience versus environmental uh, doing the right thing. It would, it would just be instead part of what is a better lifestyle for you. And, you know, it turns out that this better lifestyle, better for the environment is actually easier for you to achieve. So we, we have to, when we're thinking about these new, whether it be a new Hawker Center or a new shopping center or a new HDB estate, how can we favor the reuse system over the disposable system? Well, that's a good point because a lot of times talking to people, they are not against the idea of, you know, reducing plastic use and the idea of sustain sustainability. I think a lot of people want to do something for us, but it's the environment that makes it difficult for them. They have no way of doing it. They do not know how to go about doing it or they have to take an extra mile to achieve it. And that really is not feasible in a metropolitan lifestyle today. Right, okay, moving on. I think we've spent quite a considerable amount of time talking about the sick. Now, let's talk about carrots. Now, we have seen public campaigns by the government in attempts to wean consumers off the plastic addiction. Some of the examples are like the no plastic bag campaign in department stores and, you know, we have policies that give points as an incentive to, for consumers to not use plastic bags. Now, these don't seem to have taken off. Is it just a case of carrots not working? What do you think? The Liang one is that in your expertise and behavioral changes, maybe you can have a say in this. Okay, um, back to my point about context again. Yeah. Um, for example, two weeks ago, I went to the NTUC finest, right? So I brought my bag, right? Um, big bag, large one, because I, I do my groceries once a week, right? So, so I went to the counter, check, self checkout counter, right? Then I placed my bag on the self checkout counter. That was, and then 
the transaction just stopped because I'm not allowed to place anything on the back. So my, the first step you should do is to touch the screen and say that you're supposed to uh, bring your back or not, that, yeah. right? Yeah. So as a consumer, right? So in terms of designing the, the steps or the customer experience that, 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 that um, um, people go through, um, I think we, we've got to be very mindful of little, little steps that um, will add little friction or not to doing the right thing, right? So, for, so that's, that's just one example, right? So we're very, very mindful of these things, right? So I have to call the attendant and whatnot, eh? and it becomes like I'm the one, one sticking out, you know? Yeah, so, reverse it. Yes, reverse it, right? It be the other so way that, around. So that's one, right? Um, in the UK, where I was uh, in Scotland, where I was in, right? The supermarket, the, the, the cash ch- checkout is quite different, you know? Um, the cashiers were sitting down, they just basically scan the item, you know, and then push it down the aisle, right? And you do your sorting yourself, right? In Singapore, it's different. There are norms governing this transaction, right? First, the cashier will do the packing for you, right? And then, and there are norms governing what, how they pack, right? Wet versus dry, right? You don't mix the fish and the um, um, other dry items like cloth or whatnot, you know? Then there's a soft and a hard item, right? You cannot put chips and bread um, with cans, for instance, right? So there are some informal rules that are governing how the cashiers operate. And of course, I think the larger objective that NTUC or whatever supermarket is to just clear the line, right? Profitability, clear the line, right? Yeah. But in Scotland, it's different, right? They, you, you do it yourself, right? And then you bring your own bag and whatnot. So we've got to be mindful that on top of that, there's, there's a levy and all those things, right? So be mindful of how we design the context to facilitate the right behavior. So in my words, uh, in, in my terms, right, uh, make the, the good behavior easier and the bad behavior harder. What other carrots would work then in Singapore context? You know, we have tried the incentive bit when you gain points, if you bring your bag. What other carrots that you've seen maybe adopted in overseas practices that would, okay. you think right. would yeah. be adoptable in yeah. Singapore? So, yeah, earlier just now I, I mentioned about the, this rebate to earth, right? Yeah. So for example, let's say there's a transaction, right? Um, you like an NTUC 20 cents for everything, right? All the bags that you took, right? And then perhaps the cashier can give you a token, right? And then you go at the end of your, your, your shopping trip, you go to this particular counter, you know, um, and then you drop in your, 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 your uh, maybe you can drop in your, your token to Zero Way Singapore, for instance, or you uh, drop a token to another charity organization or whatnot. And then it makes me feel as a consumer that, you know, th- this is something meaningful and positive. And I can see the impact of that. Other people contributing to this. So imagine you have a transparent uh, cylinder and you put these tokens and whatnot. So to me, it's a question of how you design those things. Right, rather than looking at other uh, solutions, is looking at what exact, uh, existing we have and try to redesign for better and a more positive experience. Yep. It's playing to the psychology of people, in other words, right? It's not. Yes, correct. Just, the, the, the social yeah. tendencies in us that we feel. So, because the environmental message, it, like climate change or summer cow, incineration plants, they, they are far away in place. Uh, not many of us go to Samarka every day, right? Although there are some people who go there every day, you know. Um, and then we don't feel the impact, especially in Singapore, on other people elsewhere in the world, right? Uh, I, I doubt many people would go, um, um, but anyway, uh, far in space, far in, ta- uh, far in, uh, in terms of the social, and in time, right? So I think for any behavioral to act, habits to actually take root, whatever you do, right, you must have an immediate feedback positive feedback if possible. And then that creates the so-called uh, the habit loop, right? That, that, that you read in some popular uh, fiction, that right? creates a habit loop. And after some time of doing it, so you don't do it once a month, right? According to high habit psychology, it takes, for example, exercising, it takes 90 days to form a habit, right? In you, such it becomes muscle memory. You do it one day tomorrow, you revert back. How are you going to form that kind of like, um, in habit psychology, you call it repetition, right? In layman terms, it's called muscle memory, right? Such that you go and you expect. For example, you go to McDonald's, you don't expect um, um, different behavior from you different, on different days, right? Yeah, so the, the process is quite familiar and quite standard and there's no disruption to it, right? So that, I think that's, that's what we should be aiming for. Yep. Hailene, I want to get your thoughts on, um, you know, well, how does the supermarket react when you talk to them about, you know, this incentivizing, maybe taking on a carrot approach? Because I know you have talked to many of our retailers in your work. So if, if you could just explain to us some of the considerations these retailers have. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks June for the question. I actually agree to whatever Te Liang has just mentioned, especially with regards to self-packing. I'm definitely for self-packing because when you self-pack, you won't have all those like, uh, I don't know, like a thousand and one um, considerations with regards to what goes with what because you just want everything to go together and just get out of the store, right? Um, yeah, so, but I'm not, I'm, I'm really not sure like why there is such this like perceived um, hygiene um, I don't know, unrealistic or, you know, um, just, just, just these perceived notions of what hygiene standards should be. And also um, really, really a huge emphasis on what um, customer service is like in Singapore as a supermarket. I'm not sure if it's something that's internal or a culture that's built or entrenched since uh, decades ago. Right. Because when I did talk to the supermarkets about, you know, um, would you be open to doing, you know, like what maybe like what Daiso is doing right now, you know, self-packing, even though they still give the plastic bags for some reason, um, or like, you know, what Donald Doki is doing, um, they are saying that no, uh, space is really precious and, you know, it, 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 it might really slow down the whole queue and then, um, and then you know, uh, we don't have that kind of space. So I'm not sure, um, but I do not, I personally really do not believe that this is something that cannot be done if it's something that you really want to push for. So then comes back to the whole idea of priorities, like what their priorities are. Um, um, do they prioritize placing maybe, um, maybe displaying more products on sale? That's one question. Um, do they prioritize or they are really sensitive to what their customers are saying because they also receive many, many emails a day complaining and people really abuse them via emails or, you know, through their feedback forms and they become very sensitive to how they portray a certain image or, you know, there is this certain perceived expectation um, of customers in terms of, okay, how small market should be like, which is entrenched in Singapore. Um, and, and a lot of times, even though the small markets want to do more, and maybe ask the cashiers to say more, um, say more things like, oh, do you need a bag? You know, um, maybe we charge for bags, things like that. Um, the cashiers themselves are really hesitant and wary because of the kind of reaction they have been getting from um, customers. So it's not as easy as uh, telling the cashier to say, um, to ask, do you need a bag? Because they, they know their regular customers. They know that they obviously did not bring their own bag. So it's a bit like shooting themselves in the foot by, you know, are you asking for trouble, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, considerations in that sense. And this is where I also want to bring to the point that we always underestimate, you know, the kind of power we have as consumers. Because the supermarkets are very, very sensitive towards how consumers react and think and want. Yes. So, yeah, I'll just stop there and let Talian take over. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Can I just add this one point <laughs> on this? Of course, you seem to have something you really want to say. <laughs> yes. Some point about this opposition to... So in the UK, I think I read some research, I can share it, um, the, the, the article later, right? That initially, although there's opposition to, towards the plastic bag uh, levy, right? I think it was 6P when it first um, started, right? Um, after some time when you introduced it, right? When things have become more familiar and all this, and people are exposed to this and understand the, 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 the reasoning behind, the, the support for it actually went up. You know, yes. so I should we, we shouldn't be too too present presently focused. Yes. And then look at examples where the support actually went up after implementation. Yes, yes. Yep. I, I I definitely agree. It's about I'm not sure like why there is so much like hesitance or like apprehension, like really a lot of worry when they implement something small. Um, yeah, so I, uh, there is a lot of hold back. So that's where we really, really need to be encouraging also as consumers. Um, and, you know, like, you know, just be a bit more positive in that sense to encourage them to do more. Actually bringing another example that's closer to home in Penang. So Penang actually is a state that charges for plastic bags. I think uh, 50 cents um, ringgit. And um, I was actually talking to a Penang guy. I say, hey, actually what happened? Uh, what was the reaction? And they say, of course, when it was first enacted, people complained. Nobody was happy. Um, and and, and in, in the beginning, it really took like really some time for people to get used to it. So I asked, okay, so how long did it, did, did, you, uh, did um, your, your state get used to the whole thing? This, um, so the person was telling me about a year. And after that, because at first they were really angry and maybe unhappy about the charge, but a year later or six months later, when they see their friends um, holding plastic bags, they will be like, hey, why are you holding the plastic bag? Shouldn't you be bringing your own bag? So that comes in the peer pressure. And people get used to it and they support the, the notion. So that's where when something punitive comes in, a lot of supporting other supporting structures, when they come in together, it can still achieve a positive outcome. 
Yeah, I would then say, I think it takes a little bit of time for people to get around. And as with anything, whether it be plastic bags, whether it be just the new way of queuing at a supermarket, whether it be the new process for checking something out on, you know, online, um, every change people have resistance to. Unless this change is fundamentally making something a lot easier, people are averse to change because we're creatures of habit. Right. But at one point, we get over it. Um, and, you know, I'm working with a lot of restaurants. I do get restaurants who tell me that when they try and impose like a certain ban or they try and reduce the bags, I mean, they don't just get resistance from customers. They, in terms of food delivery, for example, we have one restaurant who was telling us that the grab driver got furious because they didn't want to give a free bag. And they are like, but it's just one box. You can literally put this box into your car. Hey, like it won't move. And the guy was furious. He's like, no, I need a plastic bag. I can't transport it without a plastic bag. And it's just a perception. But if this same man had 50, 60, 70 restaurants in a week telling him like, I don't have a bag. At one point, I mean, it's not worth his energy and his, and his, uh, his resources to get angry every single time. He'll just be like, yeah, whatever. So I completely agree. It's, it's just a question of, and it goes back to the muscle memory thing, right? It's just how many times you're confronted with this problem, with this problem, sorry. If it becomes the exception that you get the plastic bag um, or that you get the free disposable, then at some point it's like, that's no longer the norm and you just accept it. Um, and, and I think that's what we have to remember that it's, uh, it will take time and it's normal that we will have resistance and it's not because we have resistance that the change shouldn't happen. And it's not something we should worry about. Yeah, the change is always a scary thing, but I think in the, envir um, in the context of the environment, not making a change and the consequences of it, it's scarier. Right. Yeah, oh. but, sorry, but sorry, just, but I, I think, um, I think people are just have become insensitive to the consequences, right? Uh, there's no real immediate tangible difference. Uh, it's sort of similar to telling somebody who smokes a cigarette that they could get cancer, right? Until they are in hospital, they might not make this change. And the vocabulary we've been using around climate change and around environmental issues and always forecasting the problem to, oh, in 2030, there'll be more plastic than fish or in 2050, ocean levels arise. I mean, you don't make it tangible for people. So it's never a strong enough argument. And I feel like we are addressing the problem from the wrong end, making people want to care right. about the environment. Okay, so I think we've talked a lot. Let's take in some of the questions that have been streaming in. Um, first up, we have uh, someone talk about a, an increase in rubbish bag production and reusable bag production after they implemented a plastic bag levy. And this was a scenario seen in certain cities. So how can this be addressed? So the question is, um, when some cities move on to ban plastic bags or put a charge to plastic bags, they actually saw the reverse, and that is an increase in rubbish bag production and reusable bag production specifically. Anyone want to take that question? How can this be addressed? I have an example. Well, go ahead, Julia. Um, okay. Um, this is more of an, on a government level. But I do know that some countries, to prevent just the transfer of the type of bags um, that are being made and used, is to actually uh, consider uh, bringing more awareness to the volume of disposable, uh, to the volume of waste that is generated. So it's not so much a question of what kind of bag do you use, um, because indeed just using a disposable over buying one is... I mean, one of them is not free. That's the big difference, right? So yes, there might be a bigger production of those bags, but overall there is still a reduction of use of, dis of disposable bags because one of them is free, one of them is not. Um, and people are more conscious if they have to go out and they have to buy their own bags. This is an expense and it's something that's tangible. So I would still be in favor by far of people having to buy plastic bags for their waste um, and it being labeled as it's a waste bag because people are not going to go around with black bags to carry their stuff around, right? And they won't have this excuse of like, oh, but I use it for the X, Y, Z. It'll be a plastic bag yeah. is used just for your waste and you can market it as high a cost as you want. And the higher the cost of this product in the supermarket, the more people are going to try and reduce the waste that they generate. And then in some countries it goes further 
in Switzerland, for example, there is a tax on the household per waste generated. And, um, and people are quite respectful of this because they know that if they don't sort their waste properly, they have to pay more for the waste they, they, they dispose of in their home. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I feel like that's a different approach, making people uh, think about the volume of waste as opposed to just focusing on the idea of what do you put it in. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to add oh, a very small, yeah. small point about these reusable bags that actually, my sense, I don't have the numbers, we do, that um, a, a typical Singaporean household probably got a lot of those reusable bags. I think this year we already produced what, the NDP um, um, giveaway bag or what, you know. So uh, I just, my slight point is that sometimes when we design those things, right, um, cloth bags, um, that they are probably good for like carrying or shop, uh, shopping in the shopping mall or whatnot, but not so good for like um, hygiene purposes when you go to a supermarket when, when, when there are a lot of items inside, right? So when we design those things, or especially the government agencies, and many of them do, do, do give this kind of user bags from the People's Association to, to, to MINDEF and whatnot, um, to, to design it properly such that people can also use it for day-to-day -day, um, living and not just one-time usage. Okay, I've sent this question and I, and I think it's really interesting. This is a very Singaporean question. I've uh, heard this as an ex excuse many times when I talk to people on the ground. The question is, how would you answer to the often quoted situation where people require plastic bags to bin their trash since throwing rubbish down your church or putting them into household bins without bag linings is illegal? Well, I wanted to make a point in this. Um, it is true that in Singapore we are told to bag our trash before throwing them out but I think the question here is we are not opposed of plastic bag use the question here is the excessive use of plastic bag that is a problem so on that note anyone want to answer the question about you know how we're we going to get over this plastic bag use when we have to we are told legally to throw it in a in a in a bag and trash it can I attempt yes of course uh, yes. this is nothing behavioral uh, is just something ideal that I hope can happen that we the reason why we need to pack our trash right and throw in the chute is because we've got food waste and other types of unsanitary waste right if we can in the design of the new residential estates right get people to recycle food waste segregate their wet waste right or other unhygienic stuff and then go downstairs and put it in a, in a special bin then the dry waste you can always keep it you know, um, at home, and then you can sort it out and then do you know, the various waste streams. And if we can do this, right, if Singapore can do this, right, I think we will make significant headway in our entire rubbish collection system, but it's theoretical, right? So um, that's my wish, and I hope that it can happen, that we are like China, we, we sort the wet and dry waste, right, uh, at the bottom of our HDB blocks, instead of so, so, so we, we have moved from the house to the common lobby, right? And then let's try to move it to the bottom of the block, right? And then, uh, then that reduces uh, some other municipal issues as well. Yeah. Good point. Um, Hailin? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, yeah, yes. this is uh, probably yeah. a common yes. comment that you get talking yes, to people, yes. right? Like we yeah. need plastic bags to line our beans. Yes, correct. So um, actually it's a, it's a combination of whatever you've um, the, the panelists and yourself have said. So as you mentioned, uh, for us at Zero Waste Singapore, we definitely do not support the ban of plastic bags because we are really mindful of the alternatives that are being used, the so-called biodegradable alternatives, more sustainable uh, alternatives and you know, paper. No, it is, it is really not about the material. It is about how we use it. So we don't support a ban in plastic bags. And at the end of the day, like what everyone um, here has mentioned, as well as the audience, is that we still need... Uh, some form of packaging, right, to bag trash. So um, the idea here is to reduce excessive usage, like what you've mentioned, and like what Roxanne said, at the end of the day, even though um, maybe um, in, in view of a plastic bag tax, um, you see an increase in sales for rubbish bags. Uh, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, you are still paying for it. So, so the idea is that the, the, the cost is transferred to the consumer, and once the consumer has to pay for something, um, regardless at what cost, you will not see these kinds of bags flying around flippantly, you know, flippantly being used, being stockpiled um, to no end because it's free at home. Or even if you stockpile, it's a choice because you actually pay for it. So that's another matter. Um, and, and the idea is that you don't see it being thrown around in, you know, in, 
just the whole idea careless uh, careless use of, of, of that material so um, um, that is um, to address one part of the uh, question and the other part is so then um, if we don't want to um, buy new plastic bags or like you know avoid using new plastic bags what can we do so um, unfortunately because we import most of our food now um, I wouldn't say all packaging is justified but some um, still is to a certain extent because it really increases the shelf life of the food which is important we can reuse some of this packaging as much as possible to bag trash so we don't have to take new bags so like very one very, very good example and, and, and one bag that we like to use is maybe you know your gardenia bread bags those are very very good sizes and like what the Liang said if we separate wet trash wet with dry waste a huge percentage of the dry waste can actually be recycled so what we're left is wet waste, right? And wet waste isn't really that much. We don't need NPUC-sized plastic bags for wet waste. And when we drain the liquid off wet waste, we're actually left with really not that much. And then we can repurpose all these smaller types of packaging, um, especially if you have online shopping and things like that, to use for our trash. So that's how we try to reuse our, our, our packaging waste as much as possible and avoid taking new ones or having to buy new ones. You can save money in that case. Yeah. yeah, I'll add to that, that it's funny that we have such an emphasis here in Singapore and like, oh, the government forces us to bag our waste. It's global. I'm sorry, guys, yes. but it's not, it's not specific to Singapore. Um, yes. Everywhere in the world that I've lived in, and I've lived on a few continents, it's illegal to dump your waste just anywhere you like and to throw it out without binning it in a proper bag it's illegal it's not specific to singapore so if every other country can do it we can do it too it's it's not we're not different we're different because we prime convenience we maybe have shoots not every country has shoots um i know the new hdbs separate we want to have a recycling shoot we want to have a wet shoot but again i think the focus on trying to make it convenient by not making waste um more of a personal responsibility is a bit of an issue um, and, and we're not helping people by trying to make it easier for them to just throw a plastic somewhere um, because, you know, we, we don't control if someone's putting a plastic or putting a contaminated plastic or whatever. We can't track that. It's not realistic. There's no alarm bell that's going to go off because you put a hamburger with your plastic in that chute. But on the other hand, you might be contaminating the whole chute. So mm. I don't think by bringing the issue of how do you help people segregate their waste in their house, like Liang was saying, I think we have to take it out of the house and, and make it more of a community sort of thing, whether it be at the bottom of the HDB where you will also feel socially responsible and bad and guilty if people in your neighborhood can see you bringing a specific type of waste where you shouldn't be. Um, and, and this social impact is much higher than doing it for the sake of the environment. You're doing it because of the perception of the people around you in society. That will work a lot better than what people will think of you doing it for the environment's sake, in my opinion. Uh, that's a great, I, I totally great. agree with that opinion. <laughs> right. um, you mentioned the idea of contamination, and I think that is a big problem in Singapore. I think um, the government in Singapore, we have been very obsessed with the idea of making things convenient. It's all about convenience in Singapore. Um, to the point of having a 40 to 50% contamination rate in our recycling bins. Now, as a result of that, a lot of the recyclables, you know, end up being incinerated, which brings about another problem that we have, which is everything just ends up being incinerated in Singapore. So the question here is, someone has asked, if we incinerate everything, then does it make sense for that case to be tackled in this situation at the consumer level, where at the end of life, um, where, okay, I have to rephrase that. Um, since we incinerate everything in Singapore, does it make sense to tackle this situation at all at a consumer level, reducing plastic bags? I mean, is it even worth a discussion if we're going to end up incinerating everything? That goes back to what everyone's been saying from the beginning, that it's also the environment that we're creating for people. Um, and regardless of whether there was contamination or not, uh, everyone here would agree that the recycling is not a way out. So even if we did have a, like, we're using it as an excuse. We're using it as an excuse to say, oh, but everything gets incinerated um, and there's too much contamination. So we shouldn't be using plastics because it gets incinerated. It's not because it gets incinerated that we shouldn't be using plastics. Even if we had a 100% recycling plastic bag rate, 
um, if people were going to think, oh, it gets recycled for sure, then it's safe to use plastic, we're going down the wrong trend. Right. Because it's the increase in population, increase in consumption, increase in producing these materials that is the problem. The waste, the way we dispose of it is definitely an issue. But the problem at the beginning is the creation of it. So it's a fake, it's a fake. Excuse. I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, sorry to interrupt. I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, of the three R's, we have reduce, reuse and recycle and reduce is the foundation of everything. So instead of thinking about recycling, think about reducing first. Yes, definitely. And to, definitely, definitely. And, and, and to Roxanne's point, um, we, incineration is a quick win to waste management. Uh, it's a quick out of sight, out of mind solution. But we, are, we also have to think about, you know, like what she said about the manufacturing production extraction costs. And also, one, once you incinerate, uh, most when we burn plastics, I think one of the biggest byproducts is the carbon emissions. And these are all contributing to global warming. So we can't say that, oh, you know, once we incinerate and it's, and it's, um, it's, it's fine. We are not really looking at the whole value chain itself. We are just looking at that part, which is, yes, it's great, it's fine, it's clean. But what about the pre and the post, which is contributing to the overall idea of, um, you know, global warming emissions, resource um, extraction issues, um, a lot of other issues and a lot of other considerations that, that, that has to take place as well. Um, we have a question here, and I think it's quite interesting, especially in this COVID-19 situation that we are in. So someone asked, um, how can F&B encourage, uh, how can F&B be discouraged from pre-packaging food items and drinks so that customers have the chance to bring their own reusables? And um, this participant says that he sometimes blacklist or stop going to places that don't offer alternatives or BYO. Um, just for the context, um, I think in the latest report, we have seen a rise in a plastic use, especially for reusables, um, about an extra 1,334 tons of plastic waste during the circuit breaker period. So that's considerable. So moving forward, is, is things going to change, especially when COVID-19 is going to be here to stay for a while? Kylie? What can we do to, you know, discourage have and be outlets to um, there is to this I mean, pack um, food yeah there is this huge um, yeah we actually had this conversation um, mm -hmm. I think with Roxanne as well in the, in the previous panel there is this yeah. huge um, um, perceived notion of hygiene so back to this like notion of hygiene this I'm not sure like um, unrealistically high um, you know, notion of hygiene with, with regards to using disposables. So uh, the fact of the matter is most of the disposables are actually not certified sterile and a lot of things can happen along the way. So when um, the, the virus can stick to all sorts of surfaces and it does not exclude disposables. So um, it, is, it is, you know, um, when we use reusables, as long as we wash it and keep it clean, it is definitely okay to use. And there are a lot of other touch points that um, sort of facilitate the viral, you know, transference. And uh, reusables is actually not really considered a, a, a huge issue at all. So um, I think a lot of the retailers and companies have to recognize that and also understand that, you know, um, by buying in, you know, through the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a huge surge in demand for um, packaging, right? So with a huge demand, when there is a lack of supply, it means increase in costs. So it does not really benefit anyone and the cost can be transferred to consumers as well. So uh, for us, uh, we... It's, it's, it's a really good angle to promote because when we say that we want to support F&B, our local F&B hawkers and all that, simply we can do simple things by bringing, uh, like bringing your own utensils and not taking the extra things that we don't need. So there are a lot of fringe disposables like the sauce packets, the plastic bags, the cutlery, it's not just the container itself, right? So whatever we can not take, we just try not to take it and this also invariably supports them, you know, um, um, in, in, in small ways. Roxanne, I think you have a lot to say about this because you run a business, of course, uh, renting reusable boxes. So in this climate, what have you been hearing from the retailers? Yeah, so it's been so interesting because like Hayden said, people have had this 
uh, jump reaction to, oh, we need to use a disposable because it's a single use, so it's cleaner, so it's safer, and so people will feel more confident buying from us. And it's a perception thing. You have no idea how often that container has transferred from one person to another, how it's been stored, uh, what it's been exposed to. Um, and actually from a restaurant point of view, if you are refusing BYO, the main reason has been you've just been afraid of where that person has been with this container, which is legit because you are accepting this person into your establishment. And we contact trace people, but we don't contract trace the, the, the containers, right? So, um, and, and the potential risk that they see is that at the time where the food handler is taking this container, there is a transfer of a personal possession. And so this is where potentially the danger danger lies. If this person has come in with a single use container, by the way, the risk is pretty much the same. If I have just been at the supermarket and I bought a stack of disposables and I'm coming with a, a single use disposable, it doesn't make it any safer just because it's never been used. So that's really important to remember. Um, there are a few ways to mitigate this. The first one is if someone is bringing a container, you could just accept that you're not going to have it over into your area where you have the food preparation. You could be serving directly into it, no contact. That's that's like completely sane and safe. The other thing is, um, so in the terms of what we do and where we try and reassure restaurants and they feel comfortable using our service, we have restaurants that don't accept BYO, but that still accept to use their pack. And this is because they wash the container themselves. And the, the containers they provide to the consumer have been washed by them. So they're no different from dine-in. We see a lot of this, oh, we're not gonna do dine-in anymore, we're gonna do disposables. It's rubbish, it doesn't make sense makes no sense at all because soap and water um, is the best way to clean. Even the WHO will tell you that hand sanitizers don't work as effectively as soap and water. So um, there's been a jump to using the disposables, but actually, if you think about it, you've never had an issue going to a restaurant where someone could have had the flu or could have been sick right. and have been using these cutlery before you but they've been washed and they've been put there and they're safe for you to use so uh back to Halen's point it's really about education we see plastic as being transparent and safe but there's it's it's, it's in our heads it's really perception and um, just a little tip if you were to bring a BYO to a restaurant and they refuse to pack it for you just tell them to serve it as they would in a, a situation where you're dining in and pack it yourself as simple as that all right, um, so I'm going to take a question from Facebook. Um, it's from Farah. Farah asks, what should change about retailers' behavior and how can they educate, prevent consumers from using plastic? Well, I'm just going to jump in right here. Um, a lot of people talk about changing retailers' behavior when actually retailers are concerned about the consumers. So the consumers have a lot more power than a retailer. So if you would change anything um, personally, I think it would be good to speak about it write an email to the retailer and tell them as a consumer, this is what you want to see happened. So um, maybe Berlian can take this. You've been quiet for a while. <laughs> so what should change about retailers' behavior? What can be done to educate them? I think um, there's, in terms of promoting social, um, I'm just coming from a behavioral perspective, right? Yeah. So if you bring your own bag, um, the, the um, reusable bags, I think there's, there is some scope for us to do some marketing, you know, to promote that kind of like the green identity, right? Um, being an eco-conscious consumer. I think we, we need to do more of that, right? Um, I think that, that will add value to, to the brands. Uh, yeah. Hi, Lin. Yes, to June's point, uh, yeah, thanks June for uh, clarifying that. That is really, definitely really important. To June's point, I, I understand that some, um, you know, some people on the ground or some of our volunteers have said that, um, or some of our follow followers have mentioned that, you know, I write in, but they don't reply and I don't see any right. change. Um, the unfortunate fact is that we need to keep repeating ourselves and yes. we need to keep writing in. Um, yes, because, um, you know, like what you said, yes, it is just one person, but if many of us do the same thing over and over again, we request uh, for the same things over and over again, it, they, they, they are noticing it, trust me. Even though they don't reply you, they are tracking. So um, even the big brands, big supermarket brands, they might not have the bandwidth to reply to every single email, um, but they are tracking very, very closely and they are 
studying the patterns of their consumers. And this actually really, really uh, gives them the opportunities and, you know, it, change, it changes uh, their mindset in terms of their readiness to employ certain uh, new regulations because they don't feel so wary or so scared anymore. Believe me, they are actually very wary and very scared because they are very, very uh, aware of consumers' behavior. And an abusive complaint or an abusive email actually is very loud um, and it, you know, it, it kind of um, um, sort of amplifies that whole um, impression of what a consumer wants. So it is really, really important to praise them as well and to really encourage them and say, hey, you know, people are really encouraging. So um, as much as possible, we also encourage um, um, consumers like yourself to just pop by their Facebook and say, thank you for doing what you do. It's yeah. great. We really hope that you continue. So um, um, a very good example is that they are trialing their plastic bag charge um, until November. And we really hope that we want to see them continue and step up and scale up, right? So we really have to encourage them to do so and really, you know, outwin those voices who are, you know, unhappy about it. And the good news is that the complaints, um, the last time I checked in, are kind of tapering off and they are getting used to the whole idea of it. So it is a very good opportunity to ride on the momentum as well and really continue to encourage them to do so. And, and believe me, the collective voice of every one of us really will make a difference. I'll try. Yeah, you have to remember that um, you as a consumer have a lot of power. Um, retailers are there to serve you and they want to make you happy at the end of the day. Yeah. I'll just okay. add that the restaurants that we talk to, the one question I always ask at the beginning is, do you get complaints from customers about the amount of disposables that you get for delivery? I've never had a single restaurant said no. Every restaurant I've talked to will say that that is the top complaint that they get before food coming in cold, before food being unfresh, if ever it happens, before not having enough variety, before even like not having enough vegetarian or vegan options on the menu, then, which is quite a big movement move, uh, here in Singapore now and it's growing worldwide for environmental reasons, uh, largely, but not only. And the top one remains by far the amount of people complaining about disposables. So they know the only reasons that they can't change is because like Halen said, some of them are a bit afraid. It's a different, it's a different thing for them to do. It's a, it's a new way of looking at things and change. We've mentioned this before. People are always a little bit averse to it, but keep asking for it. Keep complaining when you think that they could do better and on what they can do better. Sometimes small changes are enough to get them going in the right direction and also make them aware that you know you know that just switching disposable to another disposable is not the solution there's a lot of greenwashing here and people will try and tell you that oh but my disposable is biodegradable mine is compostable mine is blah 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 and you know i've talked to the restaurants and a lot of them are actually are aware that you know they're doing it they know it's not the best but they feel like it's the best they can do show them that they can do better tell them that you are you know supporting them towards moving away. It's not by greenwashing that they will be able to retain uh, customer satisfaction. So like Halen said, just keep writing and do praise the ones doing good. Don't just complain. Uh, reinforce the good stuff that they're doing because that, that goes a long way and it makes people feel good at the end of the day. It goes, it really does make a difference. Right, thank you. I think we ran out of time. So maybe in closing, let's go back to the main question that we have today. Uh, when it comes to plastic bags are you team carrot or team stick and maybe if you could say a few words about your wishes for the, sustain the sustainability movement in Singapore moving forward. Um, Haile, you can start first. Okay so uh, definitely still both but still on the side of team stick a little bit more but definitely recognizing that everything has to come together at the same time, uh, you know, for, for, for things to move and things to happen. So moving forward, we really, we really want to see like, um, for ourselves, we want to see everybody really taking that ownership. So um, don't underestimate yourself. That's one. And even though, yes, I, I, I definitely agree. Maybe corporates can move faster. Maybe a single government policy can eradicate, okay, maybe not overnight certain things, even though there might be backlash. But it is really how the collective public reacts to certain things and have that kind of mindset that will really ensure the longevity of the policy, the regulation, and will ensure that things uh, stay in a certain way or whether things can shift uh, towards a better, you know, towards a better path or better alternative. Uh, 
What's that? Um, so still on the stick, uh, saying that yes, but the bonuses are good. And if I could wish one thing for Singapore, it would be that we'd go beyond this whole plastic bag thing, because it's not about the plastic bag. It's an entry to the conversation. It's a start to the conversation, but it's not, a, it's not about a plastic bag. It's about our attitude towards waste generation in general um, and the impact our waste has. So start looking at everything that you consume and try and think about how could you consume less more mindfully and how can you spread this message because it's uh, the impact of society and it's how we perceive each other that will progressively get those that are least likely to move to, you know, follow everybody, everybody else. Yeah. And our last speaker. Okay, so I think I answered the question earlier. I'm team contacts. I'm for both <laughs> solutions. It's a question of how you implement it, right? So it, just a three points to make is just to, in a context where you deliver whatever interventions, tax bans or whatnot, just make it easier for the consumer to do it. Make the good behavior easier and the bad behavior harder. And second, really increase the number of triggers in the environment, right? When people are doing the right thing, amplify it for them and make them feel good about it. I think that's what retailers and whatnot, they can do. They have the marketing power and the, the expertise to do this. And third, whenever you want people to do environmental actions, try to bridge the kind of psychological gap we have, right? Make it closer. Whenever they do something, they feel the, 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 the impact right away, rather than something that's theoretical, uh, theoretical and abstract in the head, right? Those are my three key yeah. points and wishes. Yeah. And as for me, I am team carrot stick. I think there is no easy solution to everything, but doing something is better than not doing anything at all if you want to see a change. So on that note, I'm going to pass the screen to uh, Mayu, if you're there. Yes, definitely. I think that was yep. such a great discussion, guys. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I'm just going to close it by saying that uh, we expected this session, honestly, to run over time. And that's why we did not have a follow-on session to it next to it because it's such a uh, it's such an important topic in a Singapore context, and uh, I, I I agree with a lot of points that you guys are saying, and I think to give my position and as the Green Collective, I think our our attempt is to kind of help people start that journey and our as. Roxanne, I think you pointed out at the end, get started, let's move the conversation. And we've seen that. We've actually seen that people, when we started the Green Collective, every conversation was around straws. I remember meeting Hylian a couple of times at that point in time. And we were all like, oh, how many straws will we actually get to people? And is straws actually solving a problem, right? So, um, so and, and we've seen people move from that to buying menstrual healthcare product, which I'm very, very happy to say, is actually, I think, 50% of the top selling products in Green Collective. So boom, that's impact. So, so I think that's where we, we, we have moved. So I think that's something I'm very proud to say, that it's something that we've seen the change in behavior come along. And, uh, but of course, uh, it's, it's a steep hill. Uh, this question, and I think there were a lot of questions around the Singaporean context, whether it's incineration, we had a lot, we had a very long discussion on it in the food waste panel. And uh, uh, some of the things uh, which need to be kept in mind that as a conclusion we had from that session is a solution for Singapore will be a solution for Singapore. A solution for a Germany or a France will not work for Singapore because there is a difference between law and implementation. There is a difference between a lot of food in this case that we eat the way we cook and culture. So Singapore's solution will be only Singapore's solution. And I think that's very important to have, but I think we had some great insights there. So um, in order to get your journey started, I would invite you guys to come for the Cod Green Handed, wherein our green khakis or the brands, who, a lot of whom actually can help you solving in reducing the plastic problem, will be talking about their journeys and how they got started. So do join us. This will be on Insta Live. And of course, do check out the Green Collective website so that you can uh, also get the discount. And if uh, discounts could be, uh, if charging the other way could help you s reduce the plastic waste. So here is one alternative. So with that, I will like to close this discussion. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot, guys, for coming. Thanks, June, Delang, Eileen, and Roxanne. I think it was an amazing discussion. And thanks to all the attendees on Zoom as well as Facebook Live for a lot of your questions. We've not been able to answer all your questions. We'll try to see if we can answer it later on Facebook Live. 
because the Facebook Live video will be available on our page later as well. So with that, thanks a lot, guys, and have a great weekend. Thank you.